Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to St Paul's Cathedral. Welcome to this uh, second in a series of um, discussions on great figures from the Bible. Um, on behalf of Dean and Chapter, I'd like to welcome you all here. It's very good to have you with us. Um, before I introduce the speakers, can I just say a little bit about how the evening works and the form? Um, after I've uh, stopped speaking, then well, we're going to have a couple of contributions for about 15 minutes each, uh, after which uh, we're going to have a discussion, and it's a discussion in which we would like you to participate. Uh, by the wonders of technology, uh, I am linked on this computer on the top here to a desk at the back, and if you'd like to write down your questions, and please do so right from the start for when people are speaking, um, and hold them up, then um, the wandsman will pick them up, take them to the desk, and they will communicate them magically over to the computer over here. And then I will ask them on your behalf. So that's the way in which we're going to do things. Um, at the end of the evening, we're going to end uh, at 8 o'clock, um, there will be a retiring collection for the Bible Society. And also there will be um, books um, at the back uh, for you to look at and buy if you would like. So... Uh, we're really lucky indeed to have two terrific speakers here this evening from very different perspectives. Um, Rabbi Laura Jenna Klausner um, is, well, the th first thing I want to say about her is she's an old friend of mine, so it's very good to have her here. Um, she has been, um, and still is, just about, uh, at Aylith Synagogue in uh, North London, and um, she and I do Talmud study there. Um, once a month, or perhaps less than that. I think I've been a bit remiss. Um, she studied Christianity at the University of Cambridge and lived in Jerusalem for 15 years and has done a lot with Christian-Jewish dialogue. And she's about to take over as the lead rabbi of the movement for Reform Judaism. So we're very lucky indeed to have her here this evening. Welcome. And David Shoshanya is Regional Minister for Mission with the London Baptist Association, and he was co-founder of the brilliant, very cool Street Pastors Initiative, which is a fantastic thing. So it's really good to have two people from very different perspectives um, here to talk to us this evening about that fascinating figure in, in the Bible, Moses. So I'm going to hand over to Rabbi Laura. Laura. Thanks, John. So, good evening. I'm just going to get used to hearing my voice in, in this. So, um, what I want to talk about is to give you some, uh, a different perspective, a Jewish perspective uh, on Moses, uh, which answers the question, what, when we look at Moses, does it teach us about ourselves? Um, I think the first thing that I want to bring are uh, classic Jewish texts on Moses, and when I say that, it's not just the Bible, or what we call the Torah, but is what you might not know, which is more later rabbinic literature. So the first thing that I think Moses raises is the issue of power, how we feel about power, and maybe an ambivalence about power. And what you see developing in Jewish literature is a very distinctive change of how we look at Moses and his power. So the most famous um, story, Midrash interpretation, that we have about Moses after the Bible is the following story. And um, it's so famous that people think it's in the Bible and they go, that's not there? And we go, no, it's not there. So it's from a an in, quite early interpretation, which is at about second, third century CE. And it's the story about uh, Moses, why he had a stammer. How come a leader like this could lead with a stammer? And when we look at what it teaches about ourselves, I think it teaches the message that we can lead with our difficulties, whether they're different heights, different language, disabilities, um, and also how people deal with what they put on to other people in their powerful positions. So this story, uh, or this midrash, this interpretation, um, brings out the issue of people being frightened of power, I think. 
So it's the story of uh, Moses getting a stammer. And uh, it goes like this. Pharaoh's daughter loved Moses, as we know, and she used to kiss and hug him when he was a young child. She loved him as if he were her own son and would not allow him out of the royal palace. And because he was so handsome, everyone was eager to see him. And whoever saw him couldn't tear himself away from him. So you've got this charisma from a very young age. Pharaoh also used to kiss and hug him. And Moses used to take the crown of Pharaoh. What would a child do? Would take it off the head and place it on his own head. Um, the magicians of Egypt did not like this. They did not like the crown of power leaving Pharaoh, even for a child. And they said, we are afraid of him who is taking off your crown and <clears throat> placing it on your head so that in case that he, beca he will take the kingdom from you. And I think when we look at Moses and the many, many different reactions to his power, some are attracted to him and some are frightened by his power. And you see this even from a child. So they said, he's going to take the kingdom from you. So some of the magicians or counselors proposed to Pharaoh that they should kill him. They were quite into killing boys at that time in Egypt. Others suggested, yes, they should burn him. But Jethro, as you might know, comes later in the story, was present amongst them. And he said, don't kill him. The boy doesn't know what he's doing. He's got no sense. Test him by putting in front of him two things, a gold jewelry and a live coal. So that it will show which one he goes to. And then if he has no sense, we'll see that he shouldn't be killed. So what happened? They brought before him the coal and the jewelry. And what does what happens? He's reaching out his arm for the jewelry and along comes the angel Gabriel. And uh, he thrusts his hands aside, and instead of taking the gold vessel, he takes the coal and puts it in his mouth. His tongue is burnt, and with the result, that he became a stammerer. So here's this almost troll story, which encapsulates, I think, um, attitude to, to power of ambivalence. And as Jewish literature continues, you see more and more Moses coming away from the strong, direct revelation with God to someone who is the meekest person in the world, the stammerer, his power becomes diminished in some ways in Jewish literature. The big question that when we look at Moses from a Jewish point of view, also from a Christian point of view, but, is whether Moses has a completely unique relationship with God or whether we also can have that kind of relationship. And you see both voices in the text. You see the text saying at the end of Deuteronomy, there was never a, Mos a prophet like Moses who God spoke to face to face, um, his awesome power and so on. So you have that direct line, you have Moses in the only uh, superhuman uh, action going up to the mountain and not eating and drinking for 40 days. But you also have another voice that says he may have had that relationship with God, but <coughs> what we learn about ourselves is we can too. And of course, we find the parts in the text that tell us that. So we have uh, God saying to the Israelites, make a holy place like this. I don't think it looked like this. Um, so that I can dwell amongst the people. We have a wonderful piece of Torah that we just read um, uh, this weekend when it was the Day of Atonement about Torah not being in heaven. It's not far. And it says, it's not in heaven. So you would say, who could go to heaven and get it for us and get, teach it to us? So no, you can't say that. You can't say, I need someone else to be between me and God. We, as Jews believe, that we have direct possibility of revelation from God. So that's the first thing that you have the tension between different types of revelation, whether he had special, unique, never again, 
and certainly not for us revelation, or whether because of this revelation we now can have that. The other big uh, theme, and I'm going to bring out an aid, of, is um, that Moses is attached to Torah, is attached to the five books of Moses, um, but that after that we can and must interpret the Torah continuing. So Giles mentioned that we study Talmud together. So Talmud is a compilation of law and stories and interpretations of eight centuries, eight, nine centuries. And um, we need to find a balance between Moses having given, you know, been an instrument of Torah and therefore giving it legitimacy and saying that we can carry on interpreting. So the next piece of Talmud tells this story of Moses working out, you know, how can this continue? Understanding, being taught. And what you need to see first, I don't know if everybody can see this letter. Can you nod at the back? Okay, so this is a Hebrew letter. It's the letter Shin. It makes the sound sh, like David's first um, syllable, sh. Okay, so that's the sound. And you can see in this Hebrew letter, at the top, um, a crown, huh, another thing, a crown. In Judaism, we talk about the Torah having a crown and not people. And that we revere Torah, and uh, now there are no kings. I mean, I won't go into that here, hey? Be careful. Right. Okay, just move on. Um, so this crown, which belongs on the letters, um, is what we're going to talk about in this uh, interpretation. So, the um, and when I use the word story, it doesn't mean that there's not truth in it, like with myth. But this is how we tell things so that people will remember, like parables. On the day that Moses ascended on high to get the Torah, he found the Holy One, blessed be God, fixing crowns to the letters. It's sort of like illuminating them. So God was, in a very anthropomorphic image, over the table doing these um, crowns. Moses said, ruler of the universe, is there anything lacking in the Torah that you need to add that? You know, what are the point of those crowns, those twiddles? Surely the letters are enough. And God answered, in the future there will become a man at the end of many generations. And his name is Rabbi Akiva. He lived in the second century. And he will expound every teeny tittle, every little twiddle, every little crown of the Torah. And when we write a Torah scroll, we there are six letters that take on these crowns. They're written by hand, these Torah scrolls, and the crowns still exist on our uh, Torah scrolls. <coughs> so he said, there'll be a man in the future, his name is Rabbi Akiva, uh, and he will make sense of or explain every little twiddle. Ruler of the universe, said Moses. Let's have a look. Let me see him. And God replied, turn round. That's quite a view. Moses turned round and saw a different perspective. He went and he saw in front of him rows, like this, in a study hall. And Akiva was at the front teaching and he was a bit nervous, Moses, so he went and sat in the eighth row at the back. And he listened to Akiva teaching Torah. He couldn't understand a word was going on. What is going on? This isn't the Torah that I was involved in giving. I don't understand a word of these arguments. He was ill at ease. But when they came to a certain subject, one of the disciples turned to Akiva and he said, how do you know this? The answer of Akiva was, it's from the law given to Moses at Sinai. Moses heard his name. He was comforted. He returned to God and he said, ruler of the universe, you have such a wonderful man who knows so much I don't even understand and yet you give Torah by me. God replies in my possibly favorite answer, 
shut up, be silent, for this is my decree. And when we have commentators on this story, one of the things we bring out is, this is the continuity of Jewish law. It does not belong to, certainly doesn't belong to Moses. It doesn't stay in Torah. And when we learn Jewish life, it is a continual process which starts with Moses, which has the stamp of approval, which has revelation in it in some form, but uh, continues throughout rabbinic literature. Got that one minute? You gotta keep on going. Keep on going. <laughs> I can, believe me, I can just keep on going. <laughs> Stop me. Um, so, I want to flag up an issue that I'd love to return to. It's impossible to stand in this space of St. Paul's Cathedral and not talk about Moses and Jesus. Um, one of the things that we learn about Judaism and also other religions, civilizations, <coughs> is that we react very strongly to the people amongst whom we live. And Jewish literature about Moses changed enormously because of Jesus, because of Christianity. And we have texts that we can see have really been altered in how we portray Moses so that he is not like Jesus. Um, and we have parallel texts of Jewish scholars who lived under Islam. Who didn't care? Because they were under Islam. It was a very different dynamic. So you have Maimonides who lived in Egypt. He said Moses was the chief of all prophets Everyone else was inferior. He was the chosen one, superior. He surpassed the normal human condition. He attained the angelic. Anybody who comes from a Jewish background who lives amongst Christianity, their bells are ringing at this time. But Maimonides, he lived amongst Muslims, very different. He said, Moses knew God without any mediation face to face. So he taught Moses was like an angel. Moses was special. He surpassed being human. Other people didn't like this. And you see in the most well-known piece, which comes from an earlier time, which is the Haggadah, is what we read at Passover, that there is, are only two mentions, and really only one direct mention of Moses. Who saved the Jewish people from Egypt? You would expect Moses, but no. We made sure that it was God, God, and only God. And there was no, hardly Moses mentioned, and that Moses is only there once directly and there as a servant of God. Any of the references to Moses being supernatural, not dying, were squashed. We have a piece of Talmud that says, someone said Moses didn't die, it's not true. So I'm happy to come back to that if there are questions. So what you learn certainly about Judaism and his attitude to Moses is that what absolutely shoved Jewish attitudes to Moses was uh, Christianity to ensure a differential. Okay. Very good. <laughs> so, so can I just ask you a follow-up question? Yes, I mean, come and sit down if like. Um, just no, no, before we before we start, um, the uh, the there was a sort of I don't know whether overreaction, but within the Jewish community, the fear of a particular charismatic person who had a closeness to God, and within the Hebrew scriptures, that person, that character would probably have been Moses if anybody could be cast in that role. There was a fear that that person would end up looking more and more Jesus-like. Yep. And so that's precisely why they wanted to put Moses back in his box, as mm -hmm. it were. Up his mountain. Up Actually, not up his mountain, down the down mountain. Down the mountain. Very interesting. <laughs> yes. Very I'm not interesting. sure if that's an overreaction. No, 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 no. but it's a reaction. So it's a, it's a reaction. reaction to, it's a reaction to that. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I think that's absolutely fascinating. David. Good evening. Good evening. I came to faith in a Pentecostal church and uh, now worship in a Baptist church. And so I thought it might be wise of me to write out what I wanted to say. So the spirit didn't move me, you didn't have to ring a bell. <laughs> <laughs> I want to offer a few thoughts on Moses from a liberation perspective. 
In my short presentation, I want to suggest that Moses, as a leader, is representative of the journey of many leaders of liberation movements who come from obscurity and achieve extraordinary things. What such leaders have in common with Moses and why his life is so intriguing is that they, like Moses, have had to wrestle with personal history, the elusive search and a mandate that confers legitimacy and credibility on their leadership and the consuming and often frustrating demands of a personal driving vision for a group of people. These three variables are important for any individual seeking or being called to live and lead a liberation movement as Moses was. They collectively constitute the locus and the focus around which individuals negotiate their sense of identity, are able to exercise and retain their authority and leadership in challenging and chaotic times, and it explains how they are able to hold on to a deep-seated sense of passion, which is easily eroded by the fight for freedom. Perhaps their relevance is further highlighted when one considers the tremendous weight of responsibility and expectation that is placed on such leaders. When individuals defer to them for leadership and for guidance. Therefore, given the nature of the struggle for liberation, the life experiences, the history, the authenticity, the search for mandate, legitimacy and credibility, and the motivation, motivation, the vision of those leaders are paramount both to themselves and the people that they lead as part of their movement. I think Moses seemed to recognize this fact. He was able to grasp that oppressed and subsequently emancipated individuals and communities are often preoccupied in a large part, though not exclusively, by their wrestling with the existential experience of their captivity or the ontological consequences of their freedom. In other words, their lives are an attempt to hold on to a strong sense of their humanity, which their oppression undermines and which the practical reality of being free thrusts upon them. This is equally true of individuals and nations. For example, we witness this phenomena in the way that individuals that have been incarcerated subsequently struggle with their freedom, or in the manner in which a nation seeks to assert its new sense of identity after a <coughs> dictator has been disposed. I think it's equally true of the Hebrews we read about in the book of Exodus. They're introduced to us in three states, more or less stages, each one overlapping the other. Initially, they're represented as oppressed slaves living under the tyrannical rule of a ruthless pharaoh. Intermediately, as liberated people of God, constituted as a nation, and wandering as a nomadic community in the desert. Finally, they are presented to us as inheritors or occupiers of the promised land that was promised to their forefather, Abraham. Their transformation from slaves to people of God is singularly attributed to Yahweh, the Hebrew deity. And humanly speaking, to Moses, his accomplice, who is also the leader of the Exodus. So central is the story of the Exodus to understand in the national, religious, and cultural lives of the freed Hebrews and scripture itself that some commentators have referred to it as the hermeneutical key to the Bible. It is also fundamental to understanding who Moses is and the psychology of liberation movements. Through the book of Exodus, 
We're privileged to enter into the journey with Moses as he embarks on this task of becoming a leader of and for the oppressed. We are given insights into the everyday challenges that result from the Hebrews being led from freedom. Such challenges include negotiating what I would term are the inherent legacies of their captivity, and five or four in particular come to mind. They wrestled with this deep sense of social and geographical dislocation, a sense of not belonging. They wrestled with historical amnesia, a tendency to be so absorbed in the present that the past was no longer relevant. They also had to negotiate what I call an internalized pathology, an unexplainable sense of self-hatred and putting themselves down. They had to wrestle with issues of infrastructural exclusion. Nobody like them was visible in the structures that were around them. And they wrestled with the dichotomy of spiritual and temporal realities. Because of these factors, African, Caribbean, and many other communities have developed a strong sense of affinity with the story of the Exodus mm -hmm. and with the person we call Moses. A few words on each of those three factors that I think Moses wrestled with, very briefly. At the point of receiving the call to be God's partner, in liberation, Moses was overcome with a sense of inadequacy. I think it's fair to say that so deeply entrenched was this sense of inadequacy that we could say that Moses suffered from what we might call an assumption of inadequacy, the feeling that he was disqualified from being used by God. Some would conclude that Moses' reticence was because of the nature of the task he was being called to. That would, of course, be a reasonable assumption given the context of the narrative. However, it may also be possible that Moses' reticence to be God's partner in this enterprise of liberation was rooted in a deeper sense of inadequacy and remorse he carried as a result of a much earlier event in his life, the murder of the Egyptian citizen in Exodus 2.11, which may have been playing on his mind. It did not help that the act of murder committed by Moses in relative secrecy was soon exposed by one of two fellow Hebrews when he was challenged by Moses to live at peace with his brother in Hebrews, in, Genesis, in Exodus 2.12. His response to Moses in the form of two questions, who made you a prince and a judge over us? And do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Caused Moses to flee from Egypt to Midian and no doubt altered his self-perception and his understanding of himself in relation to his people to Egypt, and to God himself. In this short experience, it shows us that Moses had to negotiate the dilemma of personal history. This is just one instance in point. One could add to this the sense of historical complexity that Moses' adoption as a child had on his life as an adult. A few thoughts on the mandate for legitimacy and credibility. Any attempt to exercise leadership, whether, when, whether one realizes it or not, is a foray into contested space. Individual egos, expectations, and disappointments often mean that there are more than one person or organization that puts themselves forward as the anointed leader. 
oppressed communities are therefore tasked with the responsibility or the burden of discerning which of the individuals that have put themselves forward are in fact able to prosecute the task at hand. Moses was not putting himself forward, but God had called him. The challenge he faced, apart from his own surprise at God's call, was whether his leadership would be accepted by the enslaved Hebrews he once stood up for and was betrayed by. In other words, Moses' interaction with God around the burning bush, Exodus 3, 11 to 22, was essentially a search for a mandate, a sense of legitimacy, and a credibility to his claims as a leader before Pharaoh and his Hebrew brothers and sisters. Given this fact, it's not surprising that God did not rebuke Moses for seeking these assurances. A thought about personal driving vision, and then I will conclude. Moses was no doubt a man of vision. It has been argued that the murder he committed of the Egyptian was an attempt to start a liberation movement, hoping that the fears that the Pharaoh had harbored would be realized as his people stood in solidarity with him. Despite Moses' mistakes and his occasional impulsive overreactions, he stands as a man who is motivated by a personal driving vision for freedom for his people that propelled him into action. In fact, this driving vision may be the definitive factor that caused Moses to surrender and accept God's call on his life. In closing, whatever conclusions are arrived at after considering the circumstances and events of Moses' life, one is left with a deep sense of solidarity with the people that Moses felt. I wonder whether it was this sense of affinity, along with his own experience of marginalization and separation, is what made him a perfect candidate to be God's partner in the Exodus. Oppressed communities and leaders of those communities are looking for leaders like Moses, leaders they can trust because they know their history. They can accept their mandate and legitimacy for leadership, and they can honor their vision. These types of leaders are at ease with themselves and invite others on that journey. David, thank you very much indeed. That was extraordinary. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you um, just to pull out one of the things that you, that you said? You, you talked um, very compellingly about the relationship between oppressed communities and leadership. And was one of the things that you were saying that uh, oppressed communities, because they've been oppressed by rulers, um, have an anxiety about leadership? in a way that non-oppressed communities don't. They have an anxiety about setting people up as leaders who are then going to and potentially lord it over them and so forth. Yep, that is one of the challenges. <coughs> and in particular, um, the whole issue of oppression becomes commodified. And, and that commodity comes with, with resources, whether it's resources in terms of access to people in power or resources in terms of finances to try and reverse some of the fallout of the oppression. And as a result, people who sometimes assume leadership without any mandate for an oppressed community are viewed as people that are exploitative and the community is suspicious of them. And I think what I was trying to drive at with the presentation was Moses' um, search for this sense of legitimacy and found it in the miracles and in the sense of solidarity that he had with the people by feeling what they felt. And in turn, they were able to follow Moses' personal vision. But he wasn't chummy with them, was he? I mean, he didn't claim his, 
um, um, in, in his connection with his people wasn't a connection that was there by, uh, as it were, being one of them. I mean, there was, there was often quite a sense of over and against the community. You know, this community needs to be told it's wrong. And it's, there's a bit of that going on in, in Exodus as well. well. Quite a lot of it going on in Exodus. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any um, tension between the two. I think you draw the parallel with a parent, that a parent will be for the child, but will often have to be against the child in order to teach the child how to behave appropriately and the difference between right and wrong. That is not an absence of love, that's the expression of love. And I think the same is true of Moses, that he was against the community on occasions, but that was part of his driving vision for them to be all that they could be. And one of the problems with the oppressed communities is that often the self-perception is lower within the communities than amongst the people that assume leadership within them. And they can have that influence, positive influence, of raising people's mm. self-esteem. And one more question to you before we open this up. I'm, I'm interested in uh, one of the things that you indicated um, was that uh, the, the Exodus story can almost be the salvation story of, of, the, of the Bible. Now, uh, I've always thought that's absolutely right. But how does... Um, you can read, of course, lots of different salvation stories, can't you? Different sorts of overcomings yeah. within the scriptures. And in, how do you think, or does Jesus, uh, as it were, if that's if that's one of the great templates of salvation, does Jesus pick that up and express that in ways that you find important and compelling? Does Jesus do do the Exodus um, type of salvation thing too? I I would say yes, and I would say that. Um, what theologians refer to as the Jerusalem Manifesto, um, Luke chapter 4, in one sense is a contemporary exposition of the Exodus event, which is the freedom of human beings and the release of those human beings to be all that they can be, to go into a land that is flowing with milk and honey and to be the best that God has created them to be. I, I wouldn't say that the Exodus story supersedes the salvation story of Christ being hung on the cross and resurrecting and, and so on, but I think it offers a very concrete and tangible um, instance in which God is decisively involved in human history on the side of the oppressed. Laura, he, he never made it to the promised land. Is that significant? I love the fact that he didn't make it to the promised land. Um, our name, Hebrews, the root of it is Ivrim, and it means those people who cross over. It's the root. And the people crossed over, but the leader didn't. And I think uh, there is something wonderful about restricted leaders who don't get to the end. There's also something wonderful about the Torah ending with death. Um, next week, we have the festival of Simchat Torah, where we read the we end of Torah and then start it straight away. And we read the death of, Jesus, of Moses, pretty confusing, of <laughs> Moses, and then start again with creation, one second after the other. The message of incompleteness, of longing, of pain, of leaders not getting there, of the people, yes, getting there, I think it's a wonderful motif as a transitional moment for uh, liberation. It really is. Can I just say about the um, Exodus that it, from my point of view, it is the universal message. Mm. And f as Jews, the continual recording that goes through our heads of you were slaves in Egypt, you were slaves in Egypt, therefore you must treat people, blah, blah, you know, that is the recording that drives social justice from my point of view. It's very interesting. I'd like to just um, take this one forward because, of course, this, the, the, um, uh, the Exodus narrative, the escape from slavery and, and the finding of the promised land is one of those stories that in, in Christian theology has been uh, inspired the liberation theology movement. So in, in South Africa and South America, um, just you know, entirely in keeping with the sorts of things that you've said. Um, but of course, it's uh, one, of the, one of the interesting um, conversations that I've had about that was to have a conversation with Palestinian Christians um, sure. about that. And so you talk to Palestinian Christians and you go, you know, is, is this sort of liberation theology mm. stuff, um, does that work for you? And they go, no. 
It emphatically doesn't work for us because, of course, when Moses is talking about the promised land, that's precisely the text that we feel has oppressed us. So then it's used as a... So, so it's used as a tool of oppression, which I think is really interesting that that language... So this all gets very quickly politicised, mm. and it gets politicised in different ways, particularly mm. in the context of the current anxieties about Israel and Palestine. Absolutely. I mean, just to sum up, first of all, I'm impressed you found Palestinian Christians, because they're fewer and fewer, um, but it does sum it up, doesn't it? The exact thing that we think would be the empowering thing is taken as the impressive thing, which makes sense, of course. Yeah. Yeah, mm. it was a it was a very poignant a moment, moment that mm. you'd think that that text, which has been so inspiring with so many, actually they go, no, that's not. So the what's instead the for them? Naboth's vineyard. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that would be the text that yep. they would they would use. Just have been know what that means. Well, we'll mm. come back to that <laughs> another time because there's a big question about. Um, someone nicked my land is what they're really saying, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Oh, they are. Um, Laura, this is very interesting about Moses um, sometimes depicted with horns. Yes. What's that about? Okay, so it's about a mistranslation. And um, so I had a heads up that this was coming before, so I managed to look it up. So uh, Moses is depicted as having horns and, of course, therefore, um, Jews. Many people think that we have horns. And when I was, you mentioned I went to Cambridge, so I was this... 19-year-old um, arrived at university, and a few people who had not met Jews. There are very, very few Jews in Britain. 95% um, of the population has never met a Jew. It's amazing. I know. Right? That's the figure from the racial equality guys. Amazing. And so I had people coming to me and going, hmm, and they were not stroking my hair. They were looking for my horns, and they were looking for my tail. And I don't have a tail or horns, but people l l looked for them. It was one of the most shocking moments of my life. It happened about two or three times when I went to university. People never met Jews and they're looking for horns. So it's not just Moses, it's us as Jews and also it got sort of muddled up with lots of stuff about Jews and devils. Um, so where does this come from? It comes from a translation of the part in uh, Exodus 35 where Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai he comes down with two tablets uh, of the pact, it's translated here, um, of the, two tablets of the witnessing, two tablets of the uh, commandments, and he wasn't aware that the skin of his face was radiant because he'd spoken with God. So in Hebrew, the word for what was happening to Moses was that ki keren, uh, karan o panav, his um, face radiated, but also the word keren, which you can hear is the same letters, uh, means a uh, ray of light or a horn was taken as the um, interpretation. So the picture of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with two horns is a mistranslation of radiance. Wow. It's got us into a lot of stuch, a lot of trouble. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. So always read the Hebrew before the English is my motto. <laughs> My Hebrew is not very good. So we've talked a little bit about salvation. I think the other thing that I quite like to talk about um, and uh, uh, that, that comes through f from Exodus, one of the big themes, is, is about law. Mm. Because when um, Christians talk about law and when Jews talk about law, we seem to be talking past each other. And that seems to be one of the great, one of the great sort of areas of contestation. And, you know, we would often read... Um, stuff about the law through Paul mm. and that through the Reformation and yeah. through Luther and so forth. And we would somehow be rather sniffy about law as if um, a religion of law is somehow not a religion of the heart or a religion of faith. Um, I think you're but, being very polite there. But, but, that's, but that's how a lot of people would have, have put it and so forth. But that's, I mean... I mean, I just, I just really want to invite you to, to, to respond to that. Okay, because so there's that's two ways to spell law, first of all. You can spell it L-A-W, or you can spell it L-O-R-E. Okay, so our, the way that we look at law is just like when I wanted to give examples of what is Judaism. For us, law is also interpretations and also stories, and, but the, the imperative to do, as it 
said when we received the Torah, Nasev Nishma, we receive it, we will do it, and then we will learn about it. There's no question that action and the imperative to take values and cover them out through action is in Judaism, and it is a difference. We can be sniffy too, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, from my point of view, it's lovely to love. I love all that love stuff. I want to know what you're going to do. So love is fine. God as love is fine. But it's just not enough. And what concerns me is it lets people off the hook for action. And actually, what matters at the end of the day is action. So our law is law and law. But what will define a person, I think, is action. It, it's very interesting, that is. Um, a, a number of um, months ago, uh, look, I interviewed Laura for um, a programme that I made on um, uh, religion and money. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that's really interesting when we've done the Talmud together and when we've done all that sort of stuff is how that Judaism is very good at telling you quite specifically what to do. Mm. You know, I mean, in this situation, this is what counts as defrauding someone, this is what counts mm. as so forth. And it's very, it's very sort of like specific and so forth. And you, you sort of know where you stand. Now, with Christianity, it's, it's, you know, when you sort of try and do, one of the great problems here, doing ethics and love and trying to take it out of this cathedral and into the specifics of the city, it's actually, it can be quite... In the, you know, I somehow, part of me um, is, is rather jealous of the sort of, the, the degree to which this is so specific and so forth. Do you see what I mean? So I do, yeah. the, and that and the, the love stuff is, is, you know, can be a little bit amorphous. I don't know if you want to respond to that, but that's always something that's... I always, I always find it interesting, the, the verse in Galatians, I think it's Galatians 5, 1, that says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, therefore you to lose your freedom... Uh, to, to maintain freedom, to, to, to do good and to, to serve others. And I think there's, there's, when I often have this conversation about law and the way the Christian views law and the way um, uh, it's viewed in the, in, the, uh, in the Jewish faith, I often come back to this point of freedom. And we'll probably disagree on this because that's why we have our respective faiths. But I think there is something um, fundamentally um, compelling about Paul's theology of freedom and personal emancipation, that you can actually, in Christ, find a point of being so free from everything that has been prescribed in the law up until the coming of Christ, that in and through life with Christ and life in the Holy Spirit and life on this journey together with God, you can discover a dimension of free will a dimension of um, what I would consider to be a, a, a donation of oneself that is not prescriptive, uh, that is not dictatorial, that is not about the fear of consequences or um, being on the wrong side of God. To my mind, that is uh, quite liberating and a better alternative to what I have seen in other faiths from my Christian perspective. Okay, so that's brilliant. So I'm looking at Galatians now, and that's lovely, that verse that you chose, because it talks about standing firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery, and that wonderful uh, key moment of slavery as, as, um, as a defining moment uh, to move away from. And then uh, it talks about, you know, you mustn't be circumcised, and it says, what matters is, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that commandment that comes from the middle of Leviticus is, in yep. fact, the central commandment of Torah physically. It is, if you count verses, although we didn't really put the verses in, so it's a bit artificial, yeah. but let's pretend there are verses, then it is right in the center of the Torah physically as well. Now, if you look at that verse, you should love your neighbors yourself, it is surrounded by action. It is surrounded by um, how to do this. It says, you shall gently um, reprimand your friend. You shall not stand on the blood of your brother. You shall have equal weights and measures. It's in the middle of very directive. And I think that 
uh, that is helpful. I don't agree, um, Giles, in what you're saying is that there is a way, because Jewish law, LAW, is very, um, is very elastic in many yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are lots and lots of views. And in the Talmud, it's all about dialogue. So I don't think that there is a way. No. Uh, but the, the um, and it doesn't mean that there isn't also spiritualism and mysticism and so on, but the emphasis on what you do, being circumcised, keeping the law, you know, that I do think that that is a positive thing. And Augustine says, I mean, it, probably the, the, the most extreme uh, um, uh, thing to say that's as far away from that as possible is when Augustine says, love God and do what you like, which is, you know, that now there is, there is about as that. far away as you can have from, from that idea. And what do you think of that? What? I like to do what I like and I like to love God, so I'm quite happy yeah. with both of And those. David, what do you think of that? I think, I, think it's, I think Augustine is trying to illustrate that Christian freedom is absolute and unequivocal. What does that mean? It means that you can love God, not that you should do what you want to do, but you are free to do what you want to do. Ah, it's, it's, okay. it's about the free will. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the component of okay, love that's that often sense. missing. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I could prescribe love, yeah. and it can be a form of love in yeah. the way that godliness can be a form of godliness. And I could focus on form over substance. What I think Paul is getting at here mm -hmm. is this um, freedom that is not about form, what you do and how you do, but is about substance, the essence of freedom becoming a part and parcel of who you are. I mean, I think, I was, I was facetious in my answer to you, but I think, that, <laughs> I, think the, um, I think the point that Augustine is making is that the love of God contains within itself an extraordinary amount of obligations, and it's ah, our responsibility okay. to unpack those obligations, and that's, and that's part of the sort of mm. the, the rather striking way of expressing it. It is. Um, you talked a little bit a moment ago about uh, mysticism and mm -hmm. spirituality, and perhaps it might just broach that subject because um, um, one of the one of the great textbooks on uh, on spirituality in the in the Christian tradition uh, says that there, there are basically two stories that have shaped. Um, the sort of thinking about uh, mysticism over the over the Christian um, over Christian history. One of them is actually Plato's uh, ascent out of the cave mm -hmm. um, from darkness to light, and the other is the story of Moses ascending the mountain, and the uh, and the, the story being that uh, the higher Moses gets up the mountain the more the clouds come down and the less he's able to see. And that's what gives you the sort of cloud of unknowing literature and all that sort of stuff. And there is this theme, isn't there, in Exodus, which I'd, which I'd really like you to talk about, um, of, of God being really other in that mysterious way. So the burning bush, I am what I am, and all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. which I hope Laura will unpack for us in terms of his Hebrew, which will be very helpful. But David, I wonder if you might respond to that to start with and say, um, how does that spirituality stuff play its way into the very practical things you know, that you've been talking about? Or perhaps you want to respond in another way. Well, i, I tell you what I found interesting. I, I said when I was going to give my short presentation, I grew up in a Pentecostal, I'm now a Baptist. What I didn't say was that I have found uh, Catholic spirituality to be particularly informative and to really help me to navigate some of the experiences or some of the things that I see in scripture that seem to have eluded me. When I was in Pentecostalism, I, I had a, what I would call an excessive focus on the charismatic expression of spirituality. In, Baptist, in our Baptist context, we have a strong emphasis on the kind of theological cerebral dimensions of spirituality. What I've found in Catholicism is an ability to somehow fuse the two so that there is a strong um, intellectual component, but also there is this inward formation that's taking place as you um, interface with God and with people around you. And for me, as, a, as what I would call a, a liberation practitioner, someone who's interested in the freedoms of oppressed communities, whether they be people who are disabled, women, African and Caribbean or other, um, what this story teaches me is that there is always more to God when I read spirituality in, in, um, in the book of Exodus and in the life of Moses. That irrespective of what I have encountered up, of God up until this point, there is always much more of God 
for me to journey into and that I can never get to a point where I can almost domesticate God and prescribe to him how he's to act. He's, he's if I can say, he's wild and outrageous and I'm not I'm not capable of containing that wild, outrageous God. And I see that in a way that he interfaces um, with Moses. I talked a lot about leadership and Moses had this, uh, uh, I made this reference about him being impetuous and overreacting sometimes. And God from one minute interfacing with Moses face to face, having this real um, personal encounter and personal dialogue. And then in the next breath, as it were, exercising judgment. And it just shows me that God can't be prescribed in any particular way and my job is to dispose myself to what God is trying to communicate to me by his spirit so that I can actually allow that to inform my practice on the ground. Before I come on to Laura I'd quite like to just say something to that because I've always thought the interesting contrast with a golden calf at the bottom of the mountain is not so much that the golden calf is golden and everybody thinks it's about worshipping money mm. but the golden calf is a thing and it's actually turning God into some sort of object that you know where it is yeah. and you've got it under human control. Whereas, as it were, the God up the mountain is wilder and excessive and exceeds your expectations. Whereas the God that you've cast is a God that you've got sorted out and a God that you've got there in, a sort of, you know, in some sort of form that then it does your bidding. You know, then it's mm. the God there for, for, for you to... To, to sort of control and manipulate and that's actually completely the wrong way around yeah. so I've never thought that was a story about money yeah. I always thought that was a story about the nature of God mm. Laura do you, want to, do you want to talk about this because I'm sure you've got lots of interesting things to say about well, this I, I have a very different language I have yeah. to say um, so a couple of things one is I've just returned to that piece that I started talking about about Torah not being in heaven and far away I think something that speaks to me more is um, is that my experience is that it's things are not so far away. Um, the thing is very close to you in your mouth and in your heart to, obs to observe it, by the way, to do it. So that kind of imagery speaks to me. And actually, when I, for me, what's helpful is I, um, I, as a Jew, as particularly in a postmodern and post-Holocaust world, there are times where I have absolutely no connection with God. She's nowhere to be found. Um, sometimes, you know, and also the being busy with theology and looking for her. It's not really a day-to-day -day part of my life in that way. Um, prayer is, song is, music is, learning is. And the times that I feel that there is the dwelling of God here is actually when I study and we say that you know when there are two people studying together the presence of God is there um, and actually I think um, that that kind of spirituality through studying through through song uh, is, is where what speaks to me more but also it also a very very distant God a God I'm furious with a God I don't know anything to do with a God that I don't think exists it represents the different stages that we go through, or I go through, um, and it's not the same every day. It changes all the time because we do, and when we look at history or present day or round the corner, uh, for me, it's very hard to have the kind of faith that is um, the same, or even faith, and that changes. And does uh, and just talking about spirituality, which I'm, I mean, I'm just. Uh, I'm, I'm at sixes and sevens because I mean what, what you say is really interesting but I'm sixes and sevens about the extent to which what I mean by that has become a sort of Christian infused thing mm. and whether there's a sort of you know I need to see the sort of specifically Christian stuff about what I mean by spirituality so well, because you've studied I mean it's uh, because you've studied Christianity yeah. and, uh, and what, w would you be able to isolate something that's you know fundamentally different about Christian spirituality and Jewish spirituality or is that a question that's just too difficult um, to, to get it's a terrible noise um, I'm trying to be polite um, <laughs> uh, uh, it well, seems polite. to me well, it, there's a piousness and a seriousness and a 
sometimes surety that I think is different. Um, I think uh, but theology. There are pious Jews. There are pious Jews. Oh, and but short what do Jews. Pious, Jews, pious Jews aren't really, you know, aren't really going around sort of. They're certainly not analysing God in that way. They are studying Talmud. So there's some about God, and there's some about day-to-day life, -day life, and there's some about law and law, law and law. Um, and I think the folk because Christianity took away that focus on law and developing the law. So what is the busyness? The blessing that we have for study says, thank God for making us special by giving us a commandment to be busy with studying. And the busyness of Christian religiosity is very different than the busyness of Jewish religiosity. That's very interesting. Mm. What do you make of that, Dave? I, I think that's a very, very um, piercing observation. And I think that speaks to uh, the very heart of our faith, which is that we say we're justified by faith, mm -hmm. but we try to justify ourselves through works. Yes. And so we have a rhetoric that's inconsistent with our praxis. Sure, that's right. So there's no congruence between the two. And for anyone who is not a Christian, that can be quite repulsive. For anyone who is, equally so. So we've got some challenges, really, to be able to fuse together um, what we profess to believe and what we actually believe. And this is why I think a form of Christian or forms of Christian spirituality can make a big difference. I think an interesting point I would like to add is that the two references, even though Augustine is, a, is um, historically an, an African, he uses fundamentally Greek con constructs and concepts to argue much of what he has to say. And so our references to spirituality so far have been uh, Western constructs of spirituality. There are interesting ideas within, uh, my parents come from Nigeria, within African spirituality, Latin American spirituality, um, other forms of spirituality from, from other places that are, are interesting and I think they're beginning to get a sense of, um, or they're beginning to be embraced by people within the Christian faith because they don't polarize between the sacred and the secular, they don't polarize between what you do and what you say, but they're all um, connected together. So I think there's something for us to learn from people from other cultures that bring alternative models of spirituality that are not cerebral, but try to bring together practice and, and, and thinking. Um, one of the questions here, which we move away from some of these sorts of um, more theological stuff. Um, one of the questions here, which I think is very interesting, is um, I'm going to read it out uh, specifically. How can we move forwards in David's three stages of liberation? in a society where we're isolated and images of successful leadership lack integrity. So you may want to say, yes, that we have a crisis of leadership in our country, that there's um, uh, with, with a, a lack of confidence in our political leaders and uh, all sorts of leaders, and that is related to a sort of individualism and isolation. Does that ring bells with you, David? It does, and um, one of the fundamental um, principles, if I could put it that way, that, that expresses itself in, in the practice of solidarity with oppressed communities is an African concept called Ubuntu. Ubuntu means that I'm only a person through other people, and I think when leaders lose credibility with people, it's because they lose contact with people. And I think um, if we're going to move forward, then there's got to be a sense of empathy and a sense of compassion and a sense of solidarity that are felt by people in positions of power for people that are disenfranchised. Um, one of the questions I've got here is, um, oh, no, no, that's right. Laura's written down on this piece of paper that I haven't... Um, uh, return to the burning bush and the I am, which I'm very interested <laughs> by, so and I do want to know about that. So I wondered if you um, stop the, yeah. the teaching thing. So um, just to just to talk about that question about what does it mean when God? Like, who knows? I have no idea what it means, but let's pretend um, what uh, Moses is turning to the bush to this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? God uh, saw that he turned aside, Moses, Moses, he says, who are you, and so on. And he says here, um, when I come to the Israelites, I say to them, God of your fathers has sent me. Yes, it says fathers. Um, what shall I say his name is? And, and, and in the form that actually isn't gendered, because Hebrew is gendered male and female, it says, Ehiyeh, Asher Ehiyeh. I will be that 
I will be. And what is lovely about those words, if you just hear, ehie, ehie, with the echo, that echo is very helpful. God's in the middle of the desert. Ehie. So this sound, which is I will be what I will be, is also a breath, you know, it could be a wind. Ehie, ashe ehie. So it basically is a way of saying I will be what, who knows, I don't know what it means. Ehie, ashe ehie. But the Hebrew means, literally, I will become that which I will become. But there is an extra layer here of the sound. If you imagine the desert, and you imagine, it's actually really useful, this echo. Ehie. It's like a breath, it's like a wind. So I'm asking you what your name is. What is God's name? Which is the question we're asking, really. Who is God? What is God? <sighs> and is that, does that relate in some way to, I mean, does that relate in some way to the idea of God being breath? Is yes. That, was that round? Well, oh, that's What's lovely. That? Oh, you're lovely. I mean, you're good at this. So um, what uh, I would say um, there is, the, what I would play with is the word for uh, neshama, which is a soul or a life, is neshama, and neshima is a breath. So we play with that thing that, you know, a breath and life are the same, same letters. So that's what I would do more than ruach, which is wind. But ruach also just as Giles says with his Hebrew, brilliant, it is uh, that ruach is the spirit or the wind, and they're both the same, the same word. And you have, you know, often as a phrase, ruach Elohim is the spirit of God or the wind of God. I think there's something interesting there as well, that God refuses to be defined. Yeah. Yeah, back Absolutely. to this reference about being God. He refuses to be defined. He refuses for Moses to, to, to domesticate him, to present him in a particular way, but actually promises to be relevant and present in every circumstance that Moses finds himself in and he proves himself to be true when he's before Pharaoh. And when they leave Egypt and they come to the Red Sea and so on and so forth, when they need food in the wilderness, when they need water from the rocks, God, God doesn't say, I will be this, and therefore that's all you can expect of me. He just said, let's go on a wild adventure and, and on the way I'll show you who I am. I, I'm, I don't agree completely because it says, this you should, doesn't mean it happened. Yes. Sorry. Um, this you should say to the Israelites, God, Adonai, Elohei Avoteinu, Adonai, whatever that means, you'd, it's a tetragrammaton, Yud Hei Vav Hei, is the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that is a definition. That is a historical or a cultural or a hierarchical or family definition. So it's not, he doesn't, or she, let's say, doesn't just yeah. stop there, yeah. but uh, does give a definition. Yes, uh, it's, it's quite possible. I, I, won't, I won't contend that point, but that definition is not definitive. No, absolutely. Yeah. The definition is evolves with experience. No, absolutely, but it's, it's more, it's more na it's narrower than the breath definition. Yes, I, I think, just one last point, I think that, as well as, as much as it being a definition, it's a reference point. Yeah, very good. That in the same way that the, patri that the patriarchs and the forefathers trusted me to be what I would be when I would choose to express myself, I will continue to be like that with you in the same way that it says to, to Joshua, in the same way that I was with Moses, I will be with you. Mm -hmm. So there's something of a promise there. Yes. Oh, it is. It's a promise. So, so what I'm struggling with, I'm just going to return back, if you can just help me, and perhaps... Um, and this is perhaps this business about you're very practical and the study and so, and so forth, is that when you talk about the, the, um, the God of the burning bush, the, the I am what I am, the, the way you uh, very movingly you know, did that, the noise which did God in the echo <laughs> of the cathedral. <laughs> now, I can imagine um, sitting here in the cathedral in the next you know, several days and thinking quite a lot about that sense of God's presence in that, in that noise that you mm. made, and how that would go. Now that's a form, that, I would talk about that as being a form of spirituality, mm -hmm. which in some uh, way that it's incredibly difficult to describe, I would think is transformative as, mm. as, a, as, a, human, as a human experience. And prayer would be somehow trying to enter into that great mystery which yeah. is, is been expressed. Now when you talk about Jewish spirituality as study. Yep. There seems also a, all, 
Well, that's what I want mm. to get at, the also. Because there seems to be uh, quite a long way between the sort of homework view of spirituality, which I'm being, you know, um, deliberately derogatory about. So it's just, you know, you're doing your, you're doing your homework. Yeah, it's pretty derogatory. And that, and that sort of... And that, we call that Judaism. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> I understand. And the, that, you know, the, the breath type of stuff. Mm-hmm. What I got wrong in not understanding the connection between the two? Well, um, Judaism is multi- obviously multifarious, and one of the... Um, we say that the world stands on three things, and I think this is access to spirituality. Righteous deeds, which you have to do, which is not charity, because that's like if you feel like it. <coughs> Act of loving-kindness, and uh, prayer. So in, in the action, in the study, and in praying, whatever that means, which really in the Hebrew means self-judging, um, then that is a way through. And, and one of the things that I struggle with is, a, is trying to move people away from a very intellectual, very dry form of prayer and much more to do with music and song and quiet and joy and tears. And I think that the prayer that we... Um, have inherited in this country in, uh, is in the movement that, to which I belong is a very unspiritual prayer. Oh dear. Mm. And uh, we're in the process of really trying to change it to, so that people can express themselves in different ways. First of all, that people can express themselves. Right. And I think that's very important. Right. Um, I'm going to do some other questions that we've got here and you've got more questions please we've got we've got another 10 minutes or so of this so if you if you would like to we've got another um, some more questions please hold them up um, I've got a question here which is uh, uh, what does Jesus say what does Jesus mean I'll read it out what does Jesus mean when he says he fulfills the law I guess that's a reference to Matthew 5 mm. yeah. um, how does that um, that's the question I've got for you well, my, my reading of it uh, is that all the requirements of the law, which were not able to be fulfilled in any other human being, have been fulfilled in and through the person of Christ. And therefore, as a Christian, someone who has what I will call an exchanged life spirituality with Christ, that I give up my life in order to receive his life, by virtue of receiving his life into my life, um, I, in, in, in a sense, stand in that place of having fulfilled all the law and therefore can experience the freedom that Christ brings to me as a person who has been forgiven. But one of the readings of, of Matthew's Gospel, I mean, that, um, that some people would give, is that actually it really says uh, you need to be a Jew in order to be a Christian, which is to say you really need to fulfill the law, live according to the law, and it's only... Laura, you have that. that Do bit. not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will be passed from the law until it's all accomplished. So, uh, there, are, so there are those who would take that as the, as the basis for, you know, when Paul talks about then, you know, you don't need to be circumcised and you don't need... Matthew, many would argue, saying something entirely different. Um, there does seem to be a tension there, doesn't there? There does, but I, 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 I don't see as much as the tension as perhaps Laura sees. Um, and that's why I explained it through an exchange life spirituality. And I think Paul, we we'll go back to him again, mm. he does tackle this issue in, in, in Romans and tries to give us some logical arguments as to why n- now we're in Christ, we no longer have to live by the law. And the central arg- thrust of his argument is that Christ has satisfied all the righteous requirements of the law and as Christians we now live in and through the person of Christ. That's a mystery in itself but that mystery is what's afforded to us as as Christians that accept Christ as Lord and Saviour. Laura? Well I think it brings us back to Moses. It brings us back to Moses. What kind of figure you know, are we involved in? And there's a very interesting piece that just where they take the same Isaiah 53 that is used as a classic proof text in Christianity, and you have Moses in the Talmud being used as the one juxtaposed 
to Jesus, you can see it from the period of the scholars, who's saying, yes, Moses suffer, you know, took on the sin of the golden calf, and so on, and that, that is, he's put in in the Jesus spot. Really interesting historically. Um, one of the things that, um, uh, about the, the Moses spot and so forth, when, when I've, um, I'm fairly new to studying Talmud with um, Laura, and one of the interesting things from a Christian perspective of reading these, um, the, the books of the Talmud, is there are m multiple layers of, of, of interpretation from different rabbis. And one rabbi can trump another rabbi. And the ones, the ones that trump are the ones that are nearer to Sinai. That's right. So if you go back the earlier, if they're nearer to Sinai, they win the argument. Now, so Matthew would win the argument over Paul, by the way. <laughs> um, that's very by quite a while. Yeah. Um, well, uh, okay, it's we won't, we won't date them. That's, that's actually debatable. But, <laughs> okay. um, what, 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 what I'd like to say is that in, in placing Sinai so centrally mm -hmm. in that hermeneutic yes. you know, thing... Uh, is, there an, is there an anxiety about that, that you turn Moses into a sort of central pivot, which is another Jesus type of figure? No, that's a great question, but I don't think so. I think it's about revelation to the whole people. You are standing here today, all of you, your elders, your tribes, those people who have never lived, those people who live, you know, who've yet. It's, the revelation is to everyone. But, but, you're, but you're making I don't think it's a Moses, Moses at the centre of that, uh, only if you hear Moses when you say Sinai. When I, you, I say Sinai, I think Revelation. Oh, so you don't think Moses? So it's so we, no, I mean, we've, he was useful. We've personalised it too much around yeah, Moses. Yeah, I don't so. think Moses at that moment at all. It's for, no. I mean, although you do say the law of Moses from Sinai, but it's not. Uh, I've never thought that before. Very interesting. Well, lots of things. Um, I've got I've got some more questions here, which I'm going to. Um, try and go through. Well, one of the ones I've got here, which is, um, which I guess people want to ask, and it's, it's one we're going to duck, is just this simple one we've got at the bo bottom. How can God belong to one people? How can God belong to one people? Which is, I guess, a business about God belonging to the Jewish people and so forth. Well, God doesn't belong. I mean, I, I don't know the answer, but I don't think that God belongs to the Jews at all. And Judaism absolutely does not accept... As opposed, if I'm going to have fun, as yeah. opposed to Christianity, yeah. Judaism does not take that approach. If you lead a, a good moral life, and there are seven things you're not meant to do, which are sort of adultery, bestiality, and tearing the limbs from a live animal, which I don't think you do in St. Paul's Cathedral. You know, people don't do that. Any of those, please God. You know, basic human life, if you keep basic morality, then you have exactly the same place in the world to come as a Jewish person. God belongs to everybody. It's not, I don't, there, this thing about um, Judaism, hold, it, it's not true. It's, the, in Judaism, it's not a, a religion by faith, like Christianity, and God does not belong to uh, one people. And yes, there is a relationship that God is depicted as having in the Torah, and God has relationships with lots of people, with lots of peoples. But, um, but wouldn't you say that the that Torah speaks of, to coin a phrase, a special relationship? It talks about an, uh, a treasured people, but that word also means a people with, the word, skula, means a people with character. Thank God, as we say, you know. And yes, this is one story, but the Christian story has God in it. The Muslim story has God in it. You know, though God is, it does not, God is not claimed by Judaism to belong to Jews. There's a Jewish story and there are other stories. And I mean, I think the Jewish Christian dynamic is more problematic because Christianity interpreted Judaism in a New Testament. So that's, that's you and me, mm. or us and them. But that's not about who God belongs to, because God belongs to you and me. And I think we have a similar problem. If I could put it that way, the whole issue of um, uh, general revelation and specific revelation mm -hmm. through creation and revelation through Christ and the Holy Spirit, we, I think we come back to this problem of what we actually believe and what we actually do. And I think it's, it's, it's a big challenge that as Christians we believe that in one sense every human being has access to God and is a child of God. But often the way we behave 
is as if other people who are different to us or outside of our immediate group don't have any access to God and we speak to them and we interact with them in ways that we wouldn't with people within our own, our own camp. And I think um, it's, it's, it's a problem that's particular to every um, expression of faith on the face of the earth because people subscribe to a particular set of beliefs because they believe that these, these um, tenets would actually bring them in relationship to God directly in a way that other tenets won't. And so over time we develop bigotry and we develop a, a sense of pride and we forget that we can learn from people from other faith traditions and that it can enhance our spirituality. It doesn't mean we believe the same, but it, it does mean that we can learn something that um, allows us to see a dimension of God that we may not see through those who are within our own uh, faith context. Um, I have to say, I think this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, it's been uh, really um, uh, honest and interesting, and I've learned so much from it. Uh, my own um, personal background uh, uh, pulls me in all sorts of directions here. Um, my father was Jewish, and um, uh, my great-grandfather um, was a rabbi in um, synagogue in uh, Liverpool, mm -hmm. and so I sort of feel both pulled in all sorts of directions and um, find that this conversation here almost helps to define me and the problems of being me. So I found it a fascinating, um, a fascinating um, evening. Thank you very much indeed, both of you, for, for such simulating things. What we, what we ask, uh, if you'd like, is just to have a minute or so mm -hmm. at the end to um, just to finish off and to, to, to sort of round off the evening with a, an observation or two that you'd like. So, um, Laura, would you like to to kick us off. Okay, Is there so, anything you... Well, I want to say, first of all, how much I loved getting back into the Gospels and everything. That's been fabulous <laughs> opening a New Testament. It's great. Um, uh, I, if I'm left with images of, G, of Moses, is what I really love about Moses is arguing with God. Mm. I love that. And I think as modeling behavior, it's fabulous because it's not submissive in that way. And um, as opposed to when Abraham says, yes, I am going to take my kid off and slaughter him or whatever. Um, and I love the piece where um, God is threatening to kill, wipe out the Israelites and, he's, and Moses says, and what will the Egyptians say? You, know, won't, you, know, you did all this trouble for nothing. And that, that, I love the, as a model of relationship, of arguing and complaining and loving. And I think that's a brilliant relationship to, to model for, for us. Um, and I love the fact he died and didn't make it to cross over. I think the one thing that I really love about Moses is that uh, despite his uh, supernatural ex experiences and encounters with God, his, um, all the things that he saw, I, I, I like the story where um, there's a fight going on in the, in, in the valleys and Moses has to keep his hands up. Yeah, and he needs people. But he does need other people yeah. Very because nice. his hands get tired and I think... I always remember that when I meet leaders, that you can be as powerful as you want, but you still need people to hold your hands up. Mm -hmm. And I try to remember that myself, that irrespective of whatever gifts uh, God has given me, um, I am not sufficient in and of myself, and I need people to hold my hands up, and that requires a depth of humility. So there's this contradiction between this man who speaks to God face to face and um, his inability to hold up his arms for long. It's lovely, yeah, it's really it's lovely. That's a terrific note on which to end. May I just remind people that there is um, a, a retiring collection for the Bible Society and also books for sale at the back. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask, uh, invite you to show your appreciation for uh, Laura and David and for their terrific contributions to <laughs>